think I'm sure he's touching me. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is billed as 10 conversations you won't expect to have when you, your state passes HB2. And you will see that there are only nine slides because the first conversation you need to have with is with yourself and emotionally prepare yourself for six months of working basically a national campaign against your own government. Um, so I decided that it would be really great to uh, prepare this group for any backlash that they may see or any other similar bills by trying to help you explain um, phone calls that I've had in the past six months. And since I'm a huge fan of social media and also a millennial, it will be told by SpongeBob SquarePants memes. <laughs> Um, bear with me, I have sound effects I need to pull up here in my phone. Okay. Oh, what's that? Oh, hi, Sydney Lopper. <laughs> In just a couple of hours, Sydney Lauper will take the stage in Raleigh. Now, a number of stars have canceled events in our state following the passage of HB2. But CBS North Carolina's Lauren Haviland sat down with Lauper to find out why she decided to perform. Why did you decide to continue to bring your tour here to North Carolina? To do this. To educate. So Cindy reached out to us through the True Colors Fund, which is the nonprofit that she started to help reduce youth homelessness. Um, and the executive director of that fund and us had, uh, as well as um, uh, the Human Rights Campaign, had like six months of conversations about bringing Cindy to Raleigh. And it really culminated in this really simple moment where she was able to come to a local LGBT center and meet with local trans youth and talk about her opposition to the bill while also holding a fundraiser for Equality North Carolina later that night at her concert. Um, it was this amazing moment where we had seen Bruce Springsteen pull out and things like that, but Cindy changed the game and she said, I'm coming to North Carolina because I don't want my boycott to adversely affect the people that are going to be there. Because at the end of the day, we all know that LGBT people are mostly working class people and that most of them need those jobs that they have. So Cindy really changed the game and allowed people the opportunity to say, you can still come to North Carolina, but while you're there, we want you to invest in North Carolina and to invest in the people and groups that are making North Carolina better. And then that was our reaction after that happened. <laughs> so I'm not going to play the phone or anything, but um, so this is a conversation with uh, Dr. Reverend Barber who many of you know is the uh, state president of the North Carolina NAACP. North Carolina made headlines this week for enacting one of the country's most draconian anti-LGBT laws. Now most of the outcry has been surrounding the effect of the legislation on the LGBT community. But the law is so severe that it states that, most, that the state's most prominent newspaper, the Charlotte Observer, has compared Governor Pat McCrory to the likes of George Wallace, Orville Faubus, and Ross Barnett, all Southern governors known for their support for segregation. But there are also concerns being raised about other aspects of the law that can have significant negative effects on wages and employment for everyone living in North Carolina. Now, yesterday I spoke with Reverend William Barber, president of the North Carolina NAACP and the author of the third reconstruction, Moral Mondays, Fusion Politics, and the Rise of a New Justice Movement about this very issue. Last week, uh, during Holy Week, when we ought to be focusing on love, justice, and mercy, uh, our legislature, under the false guise of evangelical moral, morality, and conservatism, passed a bill that is laced with racism, discrimination, uh, and classism. Let me tell you what your audience, what we don't know, what people don't know. This bill now makes it illegal for a city or county to require contractors to pay more than a minimum wage. So part of what our bill does is it also limits the uh, it limits municipalities from raising a minimum wage that's higher than the state minimum, which in North Carolina is seven dollars and twenty-five cents. We find that just as egregious as the anti-trans and anti-LGBT and anti-everyone pieces of HB2. <laughs> 
It wasn't always that way. Anybody who's done coalition work in North Carolina knows that we've come a long, long way. But making sure that the NAACP was a key part of our strategy and a key part partner of ours throughout this moment, even though we may not ag agree on some minute pieces of messaging that went out there and maybe we had competing events at times, making sure that we worked closely with them at the end of the day was so important, even if Dr. Barber still calls me Brother Mike sometimes. <laughs> and then that's kind of, you know, we're one big happy, okay. Um, <laughs> so the NBA. Uh, we've been working closely with them. We've been in direct contact with the NBA, which is crazy, by the way. These people are nuts to deal with. But uh, we are currently waiting to see if they're going to cancel this uh, All-Star game. Um, we're in a difficult position, frankly. You know, we don't want North Carolina to lose out because of this really bad bill. But if we have to suffer through this loss, then we will. Um, and we may, we may jeopardize some relationships with some municipal government leaders in Charlotte because of that. Um, but uh, the NBA's um, uh, position on this is... Zinsky was associated with Press Happen with the Charlotte All-Star Game. Is, is there, are there any developments there? Is there any kind of a line in the sand date that you have to get to to see some changes? Um, there, there is no line in the sand, and intentionally we didn't want to draw a line in the sand. Um, the discussions are ongoing. I was in North Carolina about two and a half weeks ago, spoke to a lot of business leaders in Charlotte. Who... Those business leaders in Charlotte who he's talking about are extremely conservative Republicans that control the Charlotte Chamber and the State Chamber and think that because they can compromise on LGBT rights to move our state's issue forward that they're doing the right thing. We protested the Charlotte Chamber. Literally, there's people with pickets out front of their, their building, and, and we have robocalls going into city council leaders to not compromise on their ordinance. Um, and we won, because at the end of the day, the NBA didn't know that they weren't working with LGBT people. They thought that, like, oh, if we work with these major corporations that have signed on to this letter, that's going to make sense. It's like, no, sorry, you have to talk to us before you do that. Um, so we're able to, do, we're still, we're, we're still keeping tabs on the NBA, so we'll learn more about this in the sports forum later, but really, if somebody comes into your state and is making big waves and they're not talking to you about it, that's a problem. So that's us trying to hold up the NBA. <laughs> All right, phones ringing. I feel so bad for stopping that. I'm going to have to keep going. <laughs> uh, so, um, we, everybody, so we, we, we had started receiving gifts from, from entertainers, we had started hearing people make statements, and we were working with a lot of groups to do both of those things, but we knew that Queen Bee was coming, and we hadn't talked to her yet, and we were really nervous. Because we did, I mean, if Queen Bee does nothing, it's fine. Queen Bee does whatever she wants. It's really okay. Like, it's totally fine. Um, about, what was it, maybe two hours before her concert in Raleigh, um, ben Grauman got a call, who's sitting over here, wave everybody, there's Ben. Um, so Ben is uh, our development director and got a call from Beyonce's publicist. And from my understanding, the call went something like this. Hello, please hold for Beyonce's publicist. <laughs> and so um, Ben was shaking when he called me next and he said, Beyonce's publicist just called. Um, so we, we were able to, uh, Ben and Chris were able to go to the concert. Myself and other colleagues are still very, very, very upset about this. In fact, at one point I changed Ben's number in my phone to Becky with the good hair. Um, but here is a picture which North, Equality North Carolina now has the rights to use whichever way we want of Beyonce wearing one of our t-shirts. So um, Bank of America and 
Uh, we have a good relationship. They've been a corporate partner of ours. We work with them on um, our, our business programs and things like that. Um, and um, there, when we started doing business organizing work in North Carolina around HB2, there were some groups who said that we would never ever be able to get people to sign on to a repeal letter. And I'm very pleased to say that we proved them wrong and there's over 200 CEOs that have signed on to a letter. And three times publicly, the CEO of Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the world, who at any time controls like 10% of the world's economy, um, made statements publicly on camera saying that we, we still support full repeal of the bill. We still support full repeal of the bill. They were unwavering in their support, but that was because we had conversations with them weekly about what we were hearing from the building, what their lobbyist was hearing from the building, how their executive team was feeling about it, and what their peers were saying to them about it. This was a coordinated effort that took a lot of work. So every other like public messaging strategy that we had was completely coordinated, but the business work was almost a separate full-time thing that we had to juggle and keep forward because there were so many companies that wanted to help and wanted to say things, but we needed to make sure that they were doing that in a way that was actually helpful and productive. And then that's us after we got done controlling that movement. So this is Representative Billy Richardson. For those of you not from North Carolina, it's just another old white guy in a suit that works in state government. <laughs> but he's a conservative Democrat from Eastern North Carolina who voted for House Bill 2. So he voted against his party's Articles of Incorporation for an anti-trans bill. We all know how bad it is. What we were able to do is, in working in concert with NCTE and the Federation, is we jump-started a program we've been planning for a long time, which is a trans speakers bureau. So a place where we can say to everyday trans North Carolinians, this is an opportunity for you, we will resource you, we will train you, we will make sure you have travel stipends and we feed you and we, we, we keep you where you need to be in this really difficult moment. And if you want to speak out, we're going to help you, equip you to do that. And so some of these um, speakers were able to meet with Billy Richardson on several of our advocacy days that we had. Um, and also the ACLU was helping us a lot with this too. And we were able to not only get Billy to switch his vote and to say that he was wrong for doing so, we got him to go on a little bit of a media tour to do so. And here he is on MSNBC uh, saying that he was ashamed of his vote and that he, would, um, he wouldn't have voted for it again. So, we're able to keep galvanizing that support. Now, we had to keep close watch on Billy as well as some other conservative Democrats because they're really concerned about this. And some Democrats in our state are still Dixiecrats and they're outright homophobes. And so we had to keep, keep track of them um, on what they were doing there. So we actually had a state senator who tried to put a, uh, a fix together and uh, we started doing robocalls into his district from several different organizations uh, and the fix went away. That was his face after those robocalls. <laughs> so we had a local sandwich shop that uh, decided to put together an LGBT sandwich and uh, donate their proceeds to us. And this is the gentleman delivering a said sandwich to the governor's mansion. <laughs> Unfortunately, no one was there. Um, there, there is a local group called Airhorn Orchestra that every Wednesday at 6 p.m. since the passage of the bill has blasted air horns outside of the governor's mansion and they're still going out of today. And that's us eating those sandwiches. <laughs> Governor McCrory. Um, I know I'm short on time, I won't make this fast. Um, so, um, this is uh, Candace Cox Daniels. She is a board member. Um, and an absolutely fabulous trans woman of color who actually met with the governor of North Carolina after the passage of House Bill 2. We were there to deliver, deliver that letter from the CEOs. We did not expect him to actually be there. We thought he was out. His chief of staff actually came out to greet uh, Chris and Chad and Candace, and he welcomed them into the governor's office. And um, we were actually able, for the first time, uh, to that we know of to have a sitting governor meet with a trans person about House Bill 2. He didn't change his position, but we hear that he's really, really uncomfortable around trans people right now because he knows what a shitty thing he did in making their lives terrible because he actually had to sit down and look somebody in the face and understand what he did. Um, 
And so we stand by that. Um, and there's more stories about this later we can talk about it. This is an actual photo of Pat McCrory and his chief of staff when they had to talk to a trans person. <laughs> There are many, many more stories on this. If you'd like to hear more about it, please come see me. I'll be around uh, through Saturday afternoon. Thanks.